Welcome to this video. Here we're going to be looking at Richard Mayer's Multimedia Principles and I'm going to try and give you a practical guide to how you might apply some of these principles. We're going to look at 10 tips or, multi or, te or 10 of Mayer's principles for creating better uh, multimedia presentations, educational videos, etc. And hopefully by the end of this video you'll be able to apply some or all of Mayer's Multimedia Principles to your own uh, educational presentations. Mayer's multimedia principle basically states that people learn better from words and pictures than from words alone. And while his research shows this is certainly true, there are things we can do to enhance that learning, but also things we can do that will impede the learning. And that's what this video is all about. The question we're really interested in is how should visual and graphical information and text be presented together in order to maximize learning? So let's begin with section one. Before we get into uh, exactly what Mayer's multimedia principles are, what I really want to do is begin with a statement of the problem. And the problem as I see it is this kind of thing. Here's one of my slides. Uh, and what I would normally do is simply narrate this to my critical thinking class, either live in class or as a pre-recorded video. I would simply speak the text on this screen uh, followed by the text on the next screen and so on and so forth. Now following a review with the students uh, they gave me some feedback on the slides and this is the kind of thing they said uh, and as you can see they're not really that impressed with them and why should they be? They're pretty dull. Um, so what I've tried to do is take those ideas on board and actually try to make something a little bit more interesting and this is the slide I came up with. So the same stuff, now on one slide instead of two, and what I do now when I narrate this slide is I put a music track on as well. So we get something like this. There are three elements to an argument. It needs to have one or more reasons, a conclusion, and it needs to be persuasive. That is, the conclusion should be trying to persuade a person of something that they or someone else might not necessarily agree with. So hopefully we can all agree, much more interesting. There's lots going on, it's visually exciting, there's music going on. Um, is this really better though? Is this really what I should be doing? In some ways it's better than the, the, the slides we saw earlier, but it's clearly not as good as it could be. And what I want to do is show how when we apply Mayer's multimedia principles to this slide, we can actually refine it and make it much more suitable. But the first thing we need to do is actually look at his principles. So Mayer groups them into three broad categories. And this first category is around re reducing extraneous processing, by which Mayer means uh, that we must try to avoid distracting the students. We must eliminate all that is irrelevant on both the audio and the visual channel. We need to get rid of uh, unnecessary fripperies. The first principle under this subheading is the coherence principle and he tells us if the material doesn't need to be there, well what's it doing there? Get rid of it. Uh, it's just a distraction. What, what the second principle tells us, the signaling principle, is that okay if you can't eliminate everything if there's something which is it must be there but it's not as essential as some of the other stuff well highlight the essential stuff make clear what's really important the redundancy principle tells us that uh, adding on-screen text uh, that we're narrating anyway is going to reduce learning the spatial contiguity principle tells us, well, if there is still text that needs to be on screen, let's make sure it's in the, the correct place. Let's make sure it's in those places where it's actually referring to something directly. So if it's a, if we're labeling a diagram, let's make sure the labels are right next to the thing they're labeling. They're not separate. They're not separated off somewhere else. And lastly, the temporal contiguity principle tells us that we need to present the narration, and the graphics at the same time, uh, not one after the other. And really all these principles around this idea that there is a maximum amount of cognitive load that a student can can accept at any one time or anyone um, you know and what we need to do is we need to reduce the 
processing of irrelevant material. We need to reduce the amount that students need to filter out irrelevances simply by not presenting irrelevances. And what we'll do is if we see this slide again, we'll actually see that it's full of things that are increasing the amount of extraneous processing that students need to do. Uh, there's way too much going on in the slide. The music track itself uh, is a distraction on the auditory channel, but we have multiple distractions on the visual channel. The key thing is actually this diagram, which is potentially quite useful as it sets out in diagrammatic form what an argument can look like. However, it's not clear that actually that's the kind of thing that the students need to be looking at because there's so much else going on on the slide, including the bust of Socrates, the sort of pixelated picture of the Parthenon, the, the, the seductive fact, entirely irrelevant fact there about Socrates. So let's apply the principles one after another and we'll see what happens to this slide. So firstly, the coherence principle, get rid of the material that doesn't need to be there. If we do that, we find a slide that looks something like this. Uh, we've got rid of the distracting backgrounds and etc. etc. Now, there's still a lot of information on there and we can still do a lot better, but it's much clearer here that the diagram is the important thing. So there's stuff that I don't really feel we can get rid of, but if we apply the signaling principle, we see that uh, actually I can maybe go some way to highlighting what's important, which for me on this slide, I, what I want students to take away is the idea that there are three elements to an argument. So let's apply the signaling principle. And we can see here that the, the text is not, not now all the same. We have some text that's bold and underlined, another text that's in a normal font. Uh, and it's a bit clearer now what it is that I want the, the student to get from this slide. However, I could I could signal it a little bit more, add a bit of yellow highlighting to it. But actually, if we apply the redundancy principle, which says that adding on screen text and narrated diagrams uh, reduces the amount of learning, we see that what's the point of having all this text on the screen when I'm going to be read it any, reading it anyway? Let's really narrow that down to just the essential bit which is perhaps something that looks a bit more like this. Now, if we then apply the spatial contiguity principle, which says that if text needs to be on screen, then the words should be next to the part of the graphic they're referring to, we can actually see we can do better than simply place this information at the bottom of the screen, because it's still not entirely apparent to the learner which bit is which. If we do something like this, we can see that the text is now much closer to the parts of the diagram that it refers to. We can perhaps do better still. We can incorporate the heading and we can see those parts in the larger and bolder font are now much more apparent to the students. Uh, we've signaled them and we could even do a little bit more there so that when I narrate it, I can signal the particular parts I'm referring to when I say that there needs to be a th three elements to an argument uh, and there are reasons leading to a persuasive conclusion. Lastly, assuming we're fairly happy with this slide as it is now, let's think about the temporal contiguity principle because I could, if I wanted, start off with a slide like this that says what is an argument and then I give my narration where I say there are three elements to an argument, etc., etc. And I then go on to this slide and maybe just pause for 30 seconds or so while, while I let the students digest that information. Uh, May says no, what we need to do is actually present the narration and the graphics concurrently, not consecutively. So I simply narrate the slide as it is, uh, presenting that information on the visual and the audit auditory channel simultaneously. OK, let's wrap up this section with uh, an end of section quiz. So, which may have, may as multimedia principle states that where it is not possible to remove all extraneous information from a diagram or animation, the important information should be clearly highlighted. Uh, well, it is, of course, the signaling principle. OK, on to section two. 
In this section, May is saying we need to manage the essential processing. Uh, so again, taking this idea of there being a maximum sort of amount of cognitive input, they're saying, right, we've, we've, we've stripped out all the stuff that uh, is extraneous. Uh, now, how do we make sure that we don't overload students? How do we make sure we present information in a manageable way that can be processed? Firstly, he tells us, uh, let's think about the segmenting principle. Let's break the complicated material into sections or parts. We could use continue or next buttons if we're making sort of interactive presentations or simply break up videos or, or, or other presentations with quizzes. The pre-training principle says, let's explain those specialist terms before bringing them all together, before bringing them together with, with, with diagrams or with other information. Uh, because otherwise we'll be trying to sort of process them at the same time as we're trying to process something else. So let's manage that where we've got new and unfamiliar terms. Let's, let's define them, let's explain them up front. Finally, the modality principle says that uh, let's use spoken rather than printed words where there are graphics presented. This presents an overload of the visual channel. It pushes some of the processing onto the auditory channel uh, and allows us to, to free up some of that processing space on the visual channel. And we can see how these work uh, in practice. Uh, now, I'll show you that on some of uh, this, this presentation. So, for example, on the segmenting principle, uh, I've broken up this presentation into four different parts, uh, each introduced with a clear section heading. I've tried to use a sort of color-coded border so we know which section we're on and I've wrapped up each section, as you'll see, with a quiz. Here, the pre-training principle. Well, again, I've done that in this presentation. What I've tried to do here is actually bring in Mayer's terms, or new specialist terms, before I've shown uh, how they work in practice. So there's an example of pre-training. I could have done that with the critical thinking slide as well. Before the diagram, I might have had other slides which explained um, what a, a, a conclusion was, what a, a reason was, and then bring those together to show how they form together to produce an argument. And then finally, the modality principle about using spoken rather than printed words. So we'll see uh, in section four where I present this graph that I've tried to do that here. Uh, there's a space for some text at the bottom of the diagram uh, and I've actually put a reveal in there so that when students initially see the diagram then there's not really any information around that. They're, they're directed very much to those the idea that there are various different effect sizes and later on um, I reveal the text. Now that's quite a simple ex example. Um, and actually, you know, the, the, the text itself there is not particularly distracting, but it helps just to draw the information to the uh, the, the chart and then to show uh, which sort of elements of the uh, uh, of the multimedia principles apply to which effect sizes. So there's a, a sort of simple example of the modality principle. OK, so end of section two quiz. Which of Mayer's multimedia principles states that where new and unfamiliar terms are introduced into diagrams and animations, students should be acquainted with these terms prior to viewing the diagram. Uh, and of course, it is the pre-training principle. OK, section three. And Mayer here is interested in the uh, fostering of generative processing, by which he means uh, we've we, we've, we've made sure we're not distracting students, we've made sure that we're not overloading students, but now how can we motivate and encourage students to want to make sense of the material we're presenting to them? And here he uses uh, two principles. The first is the personalization principle, in which he says let's use friendly conversational styles uh, rather than very formal styles, and make sure we narrate with a human voice rather than with a computer voice. In my slides, here's an example. This is the text, the sort of primary bit of text. No, it's, it's, it's kind of OK, um, but we could make it friendlier. And one way of doing that is simply by uh, speaking directly to the, uh, the, the listener uh, and engage, trying to engage them as a person. And we can do that by using the word you and your a lot. And what I've done here is simply reworded it 
uh, and tried to include you and your uh, you know as, as much as possible so it feels a bit more personal it feels a bit more conversational and fine and also we've got the uh, the uh, voice principle, which states that a, uh, a, a human voice is certainly much better than a uh, machine voice. So, would we rather have Robbie the robot, or would we rather have Orson Welles narrating the presentation? Well, hopefully, it's Orson. And let's play a bit of computer voice, and you can see what kind of uh, what effects we get from that. You have three elements to an argument. You need to have one or more reasons, a conclusion and your argument needs to be persuasive. That means that your conclusion should be trying to persuade somebody of something that they might not necessarily agree with. OK, well, hopefully we can argue that, you know, maybe uh, you know, it might be interesting for sort of 30 seconds or so, but we probably wouldn't want to put up with that for uh, a sort of 10 or 15 or even 20 minute presentation. So again, friendly, conversational, human voice narrating and that will help to foster generative processing. And just for the sake of continuity, let's wrap it up with a quiz. Uh, and which the principle states the voiceover narration should be friendly and conversational? Well, of course, it is the personalization principle. OK, so very quickly, section four, what I want to show here is the effect sizes. Each of May's multimedia principles, well, they're not equal they're not all uh, they don't all have the same effect some of them have a bigger effect than others all of them as you can see are above 0.4 now 0.4 is important because this is generally regarded as the level at which effects are worth pursuing so uh, many different kinds of intervention uh, will produce positive effects but actually if these positive effects are very small then really they're not worth pursuing because chances are there is going to be something that you could do which will have a greater effect. And generally it's agreed, 0.4 is the, is the sort of benchmark. So if it's above that, it's worth looking at. Uh, if it's not, well, there's probably something else you could be doing that will yield greater effects for the same amount of effort. Uh, and of course, the key thing you want to know is, well, which is which? So these were all the effect sizes which were stated in May of 2009 but which I'll reference uh, later and you can see things like the temporal, personalization, spatial, modality all have big effect sizes above one uh, but all have effect sizes worth pursuing. Uh, and, 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 and most of these uh, will be, the effects will be bigger the more inexperienced your learners are so if you're talk if we're doing this with first year undergraduates we can hope for these larger effect sizes if we're doing them with postgrad students who are very sort of you know, have a, a lot of subject knowledge anyway we probably won't get uh, we probably won't get these effect sizes so the the more inexperienced the learners are the bigger the effect sizes the that the more worthwhile it is doing this what I'd just like to finish on is uh, this chap in the corner here. Uh, we often see in these kinds of videos that there is a webcam feed with a person sort of doing the presentation featuring in the webcam. Uh, is this necessary or not? Well, Mayer's research says it has a negligible positive effect around 0.22. And I think what we can say is that if you particularly want to do it, um, there's no reason you shouldn't however if you particularly don't want to do it there's no reason you should uh, I think chances are it probably does cause a little bit of extraneous processing however on the on the positive side it may help to foster a little bit of generative processing so I think this is one that's very much to be left up to the discretion of the individuals if it's the kind of thing you like doing, do it. If it's the kind of thing you don't like doing, then don't worry about it. So a few links for further reading and viewing. Uh, of course, Richard Mayer's book, Multimedia Learning, published by Cambridge University Press, explains this all in great detail. Uh, and Mayer also did a very good presentation at Harvard, where he chats for about an hour about the, the different principles and takes questions from the audience. Uh, very interesting, lots of practical examples being used there. 
Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, this presentation is available under a Creative Commons license, uh, and there's my Twitter uh, name. If you've uh, if you enjoyed it, then yeah, great. If you didn't enjoy it, if you think I've got things wrong, yeah, great. I'd love to hear from you. Tell me where I went wrong, and uh, I'll sort those out. Thank you very much.